Hello, everybody. My name is Wolf Geppert. For those who don't know me, I am the chair of the European Astrobiology Institute. And I would like to welcome you all to this seminar of the European Astrobiology Institute. I think it's a little bit redundant to present Thomas Henning because you will have, have heard of him and will have met him. But just to say shortly that um, uh, Thomas Henning studied physics and mathematics uh, which at a university which was for some time the oldest Swedish university, namely the University of Greifswald. And then he studied um, astrophysics and astronomy at the University of Jena, where he got his PhD in 1984. He then went for a short postdoc to Prague and returned to the University of Vienna. Uh, sorry, of Vienna, uh, where he um, then got the full professorship in 1999. He then moved to the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg, where he is acting as a director since 2001. I think I will leave over the floor now to Thomas, and I hope you will also enjoy this seminar. Thanks a lot, Thomas, for coming, and the floor is yours. Okay, so um, I want to talk today about uh, molecular complexity, and uh, I wanted to start with an iconic image. Uh, I need to, to change a few things here still. Just wait a second. That looks better. Uh, I want to start with an iconic image uh, of the Earth, which is close to 50 years old now. And uh, most of you have seen this image. And it nicely summarizes a number of features uh, the Earth has, which were certainly important for the formation of life. That is a rocky surface, water, and an atmosphere. And we, of course, know that the early atmosphere was very different from what we see today. And we have another addition, and that is life. And the big multi-billion dollar question is, of course, how we could go from uh, this uh, system to life. I have to admit that I'm, again, stuck here somehow with this presentation mode. Okay, so now it seems to. Yes. Uh, so um, I mentioned this iconic image, and then uh, what we really want to know is, of course, how the transition works from geochemistry to biochemistry. And just as a reminder, uh, the Earth has an age of 4.56 billion years, uh, very easy to remember. And then shortly after the formation of the Earth, we actually had another event the formation of the moon, uh, and only after that we can expect uh, that life formed. And what you see here is actually the old circon crystal. Uh, these are the oldest crystals uh, we have on Earth, and uh, they have been dated up to 4.4 billion years ago. And actually the investigation of the oxygen isotopes indicated that we may have a hydrosphere already around 4 billion years ago. And that is also the time where we think uh, we had the transition from geochemistry to biochemistry. You also see that uh, at an age of about 2 billion years, there was another uh, important event happening, and that was the rise in atmospheric oxygen, uh, which finally led to the formation of more complex uh, species. So what we want to do, we want to discuss uh, the period uh, four billion years ago, and we want to see how we can actually build up uh, molecular complexity at these early phases. So let's see what we have today and uh, what we actually want to obtain at some point. So this is, the cell, 
Uh, actually, it's a cell which contains only the most important elements and still you immediately realize that it is uh, quite complicated. Uh, the cell has actually a number of functions. One is to translate information via the DNA system. And the other one is, uh, of course, to organize metabolism. And uh, we have today, in modern life, we actually have a DNA protein polymer world. And we have here in this uh, specific system, a bilayer lipid vesicle, uh, which is uh, actually uh, serving as a kind of reactor surface. And we all know that the proteins act as enzymes. Uh, they help to transmit signals. They are, in a way, the tools of the cell, and the DNA is the memory of the cell. So somehow, uh, we want to obtain a similar system, and we already see that polymers play a big role and that we have this coupled system of uh, enzymes and the DNA. So we can uh, actually consider uh, two different pathways uh, for the early Earth to form organic feedstock molecules. One possibility would be to deliver the organics from space, uh, for instance, via meteorites. And the other possibility is that we have uh, abiotic synthetic reactions on the early Earth uh, which form the prebiotic molecules and then in the next step the prebiotic polymer which may lead to the RNA world and finally to the modern protein DNA world. In many papers we actually see that uh, the transition from the prebiotic soup to the prebiotic polymers and then possibly to the RNA world is actually the most difficult part of the whole process. But um, I will actually indicate that even the formation of organic feedstock molecules is a challenging task uh, under the conditions of early Earth. So I already talked about the RNA world. Uh, uh, this uh, term was actually coined by Gilbert in 1986, but uh, the idea was around uh, much earlier. The idea is actually that uh, RNA can uh, handle two functions. One is uh, to store information, and the other function would be to act as a catalyst, what uh, in the modern life uh, the proteins are doing. So uh, this was a hypothesis, but later it could be shown that indeed, uh, there are NA enzymes, and uh, this could actually be a viable way. I should point out that today, uh, and I, I think I personally also support such hypothesis, that the NA world may not be an isolated uh, system. In fact, very early on, NA and peptides may have cooperated, uh, and one shouldn't. Uh, think about an isolated RNA world any longer. So what do we actually need uh, for the synthesis of RNA? Uh, we have here the different uh, elements. We have uh, the nuclear base so here, in this case, uh, guanine, and we have the ribose, uh, the sugars, uh, and that's the only difference between the DNA and RNA. And, uh, these two components together uh, form then the nucleosides. And then we also need to have phosphates, uh, which allow to build uh, larger chains and the polymers. So this looks actually all pretty simple, uh, but in fact, it is not. So um, I already mentioned that uh, we should uh, really consider the RNA together with the peptides and potentially also uh, with membrane systems so that even the early life, we already have a kind of pre-cell system, uh, which is uh, similar to what we know about modern life today. 
So you have seen that uh, we, we need to build nucleotides uh, for RNA and DNA. Um, for the proteins, we would need amino acids, uh, peptides, and lipids. Uh, and I mentioned that we can supply organic material from space, or we can form organic material under early Earth conditions. So what's now very, very different in the early atmosphere is a composition of molecules. So we, of course, don't have oxygen, uh, and we don't have a very reducing atmosphere, which is very different from the conditions Miller and Ura used to, to form their amino acids. So we have practically CO, water, and molecular nitrogen. And if you ask a chemist to build up uh, organic molecules under these conditions, he will actually have a hard time. So we have uh, what kind of molecules would we like to have? So very important molecules are nitriles. I will uh, discuss this a little bit further and more detail. Uh, formaldehyde is another uh, important feedstock molecule because the self-condensation of formaldehyde uh, can lead to sugar. It's, it's a famous FOMOS reaction. Uh, we have formamide, uh, ammonia, and the phosphates. The phosphates are actually a big problem because uh, phosphates uh, normally for minerals, which are not accessible uh, by life, but uh, we need to find a way to have uh, phosphates available. And one possibility are actually high carbonate lakes uh, as um, proposed in a, in a recent paper by Toner and Catling in 2020. So the phosphate problems around since a while, uh, there was also a proposal that triversate may actually help, uh, but uh, I really like this idea of, of the carbonate lakes, which may actually be a natural habitat for the phosphate uh, formation. So let's talk about HCN. Why is HCN actually interesting? Uh, uh, in, in a modern chemical lab, it's, uh, it's a very dangerous molecule for life, but uh, it was obviously something very interesting. And uh, because the deprotonated HCN is a nucleophile and can help to build carbon-carbon uh, chains. So what, how could we actually form HCN under the conditions uh, I just mentioned? And, and one very interesting proposal is that we had major impacts in the so-called late linear phase where iron-rich uh, bodies impacted uh, the oceans, uh, led to uh, the formation of uh, molecular hydrogen and together with the CO2 of the atmosphere and the iron from the impactor, uh, it could form methane and water. Uh, this would be uh, uh, concentration which uh, peaks at some point after the impactor and then decreases again quite rapidly. And then together with photochemistry, which would form radicals like CH2 and CH3 and would also lead to the dissociation of molecular nitrogen, you can then form HCN for methane. So this is a very interesting Proposal. There is a very nice paper by Sanedal, 2020. And if you are interested in, in the more uh, comprehensive uh, chemistry of HCN formation by photochemistry, uh, we wrote a recent paper where we discussed Titan chemistry and actually listed all the chemical reactions. And um, this paper was led by Ben Pierce a student from McMaster uh, I'm working with. So the next steps, uh, if you have HCN, uh, then uh, you can actually form adenine. This is already known since quite a while, uh, since the 60s. If you take HCN and ammonia, you can form adenine. Uh, but uh, even more interesting, uh, in a recent paper by Patel and then also Britson, they actually demonstrated that you can form ribonucleotides, amino acids, and lipid precursors 
from a mixture of HCN and sulfur bearing species and, uh, and UV, and uh, if you add UV radiation. And another paper by, by the Munich group, uh, they synthesized uh, an A nucleotides. Uh, and um, here you see all of these nucleotides uh, uh, based uh, basis actually. So there, there is really, uh, if you start with HCN or related molecules, you can really build up uh, NA compounds. The other interesting uh, reaction is the reaction which uh, starts from formaldehyde. And again, you know, formaldehyde has been actually discovered also in molecular isis uh, in the interstellar medium. Uh, it's, it's a relatively simple molecule. Uh, and uh, there was always a proposal that you can actually uh, self-condense formaldehyde, but it's only possible uh, if you use uh, a catalyst because uh, you need uh, umpulung reaction uh, and that's uh, only driven by catalysts. So without that, uh, it would not work. Uh, there are actually two very interesting recent developments. One is uh, that you can also do that in the absence uh, of a base and a solvent in the gas phase or on a surface uh, using uh, hydroxymethylene, and, uh, which is actually an unstable molecule. But you can also do that uh, uh, via mechanochemical uh, sugar synthesis uh, with a variety of minerals, as has been shown in the recent paper by the DRUP group. So I, I wanted to give you these two examples. So formation of, of sugar and an A compounds. And you see how important it is to understand these very early steps uh, in the formation of HCN or formaldehyde or related molecules. It's quite amazing that you can actually also build sugars uh, in molecular isis. And this is a very nice experiment by the Minot group where they started with isis, which contained water, methanol, and ammonia uh, in an ice mantle around dust particle and could also form uh, ribose and other sugars. Uh, the, the real challenge in these experiments is always identification because you get a huge mixture of material. I should also point out that glycoaldehyde was actually found in a protostar uh, at the very beginning of the um, operation by Jürgen Sindel. And uh, indeed, obviously, uh, space can provide the conditions to form such complex molecules. Now let's go to, to the other direction. I, I talked mostly about the early Earth and what can happen on the early Earth. Let's talk about complexity uh, produced in uh, astronomical environments. And uh, if you have your meteorite parent body, uh, especially a Copernicus meteorite, uh, and an example is a Merchant's meteorite, uh, which was collected in Australia, uh, you actually get amazing uh, variety of materials, amino acids, uh, sugars, alcohols, sugar acids, nuclear bases, and, and very recently, there was even a claim that proteins uh, have been identified. And you also have uh, some phosphates uh, and various sulfides, which can actually act as catalysts. And then if you go to cometary type material, uh, glycine was identified uh, in the Stardust mission and also by the Racina mass spec uh, by Altbegadal. So you see that indeed, uh, under these conditions, we can actually get uh, quite some complexity in terms of organic material. And just to make a bit of a jump, uh, that is uh, the structure of a planet forming disk around a young star. Uh, and it contains small particles, which uh, finally grow to planets and you have the temperature and density gradient, and you also have UV irradiation, cosmic rays penetrating the surface layers. And you see on the right side, 
uh, the different vertical structures, the photo dominated a layer at the surface, then a layer where you can expect the rich molecular chemistry. And then at the mid plane where the temperatures are so low that everything is frozen out, which we then call the ice layer. So we have two types of chemistry. One I uh, already mentioned, we have a silicate core and an ice mantle. Uh, and uh, here you have uh, a variety of chemical processes operating. You can have radical chemistry driven by UV electrons or ions. And then you can also have a neutral chemistry uh, where you actually, for instance, go from CO, uh, which is observed in these molecular ices, uh, to uh, methanol or from uh, nitrogen to ammonia. But there's also gas phase chemistry, which is mostly triggered by, by cosmic rays and uh, which then leads to the formation of H2 plus. And then this reacts again with molecular hydrogen and you have an ion which can then drive the chemistry. So what do we see in these this? And I think it is important to realize what it means to find a molecule, to observe a molecule in these this. So let's uh, take the normal mass of a disk, which is about 10 to minus two solar masses. And let's assume that the CO molecule would be as abundant as in the, in the stellar medium, which is a factor of 10,000. Uh, then we would only have a mass of 10 to minus six solar masses in CO and all the other molecules are even much less abundant. So what do you really need to have in order to find uh, these molecules is uh, enormous sensitivity. And the only uh, system which can provide this enormous sensitivity is the IMA submillimeter millimeter array in Chile, which also led to the discovery of some of these complex molecules. So what has been seen so far is uh, the anopoline. Uh, that is actually a molecule we detected uh, with Noema in, in France. Uh, but then there's also metal cyanide uh, which is somehow correlated uh, with HCN and HC3N. And then uh, methanol, the oxygen containing molecule has been discovered in TW hydra. And if you then use your knowledge uh, of uh, chemistry in these discs, then you could expect uh, the presence of uh, organics in the outer discs. Uh, and you would also expect to find other molecules than I just mentioned. So here I, I show you two examples on the left side. Uh, it's a uh, uh, disk around a young star, TW Hydra, uh, the most nearby young star where we can do the experiment. And you see here the emission from formic acid. And on the right side, uh, it's an interesting nature experiment. You go to the sublimation front at the edge of the snow line where uh, the material is coming off from the grains uh, when you heat it up in an uh, outbursting source here in this FOE type object. And you see methanol, uh, you see also acetaldehyde, acetone, and other molecules. So all that stuff is actually sitting at lower temperatures uh, on your crane surfaces and can uh, then uh, lead to more complex species. You can also do the same experiment, uh, now going to shorter wavelengths to the infrared and use uh, molecular features in the infrared that has been done uh, with Spitzer uh, and also Herschel. And, and you see here uh, that uh, we have, for instance, HCN and C2H2. And even more interesting uh, is that we even see uh, Larger molecules like pH is also important planetary disks. Here I show you the, the spectra of quite a number of these features, and we see uh, quite some chemical diversity, which is probably induced uh, by the UV field. And we also have seen um, a, a variety of uh, molecular emissions. On, on the left side, you see in yellow what we have discovered for sun-like stars 
and a red for cool stars. And you see that around sun like stars, we see HCN in the inner regions of this, but not around cool stars because we probably don't have the energy to dissociate uh, molecular nitrogen. And on the right side, uh, you also see uh, the water lines, not only acetylene and HCN and CO2, uh, but you also see a lot of water lines uh, in this inner disk uh, around a young star, in this case, a tau. So we have quite a diversity in inner disk atmosphere chemistry uh, depending on the central stars, uh, but uh, you, you get a bit of an idea that indeed uh, we can produce a lot of this stuff. And if you um, observe a disk from edge on, so we, you will see actually absorption features instead of emission features. And uh, here you see the water ice bands, methanol, uh, CO2. We also know that uh, carbon monoxide exists, NHC exists. So you have a lot of interesting uh, molecules in your molecular isis which can trigger more complex uh, molecules. So I, I also wanted to show you um, uh, the relation between the HO bearing molecules uh, discovered in, in comets and um, in the source IRAS 16293, this star I already mentioned. And uh, what I always find amazing that there seems to be a pretty good uh, correlation between these abundances, which may actually point to the fact that some of the molecules, maybe all of this complex nature, may already be produced in a phase which predates the disk phase, so the molecular cloud cores or photostars from which uh, the disk then formed. So this, it's a very similar diagram here where I show you the comets and interstellices uh, and uh, comparison between the comet composition uh, and the upper part of the figure and the composition of W33A which is uh, in, in the lower part, uh, which shows you uh, indeed that we have a bit of uh, similarity uh, between these different species. Uh, we can maybe take out methanol here, uh, where we have uh, quite similar abundances uh, in, in the comet and in this uh, poorest star, W33A. I guess you have seen uh, this figure um, because uh, this is one of the highlights of the Rosetta mission uh, where primitive interstellar medium material was measured and you see a large group of species ranging from nitriles again, which is uh, really interesting. You see the amines, alcohols, uh, carbonyls, uh, uh, and uh, I find that quite amazing that uh, we could get the type of catalog of, of this material and the organic materials also strongly deuterated, uh, which uh, speaks in favor of a formation at the low temperatures in these uh, cold protostellar envelopes. Uh, let me now go back to, to the lab, and uh, this is very close to, to my heart here. Uh, there are quite a number of groups in the world uh, uh, which work on that. Uh, so what you practically need to do, you need your UHV chamber, uh, you need uh, uh, good uh, mass spec uh, possibility, uh, you need uh, uh, also a potentially infrared spectrometer to support your measurements. Uh, and of course, I mean, if you want to go to to higher AMU values, you may use the Orbitrap uh, to study the composition of the material. But even with the Orbitrap, you may get huge family of complex molecules, which are very challenging to, to uh, identify. 
so just to give you uh, two examples here, uh, because I talked about formaldehyde, methanol, uh, there was a very nice uh, early uh, experiment uh, where the hydrogenation of uh, CO was studied in a water CO ice experiment at 10K, and that led to the formation of formaldehyde and methanol and what we did is a bit different. We used the carbon, carbon surface and we bombarded the carbon surface uh, with oxygen and hydrogen atoms, which are available uh, in the disks and the molecular cloud cores. And uh, indeed, we could also form, again, uh, formaldehyde. So this is a very robust uh, formation route uh, in, in these uh, surfaces. Uh, provided by the cranes. We also did something different. Uh, this was actually reaction at very low temperatures. We used the helium cluster system uh, and uh, studied the reaction between carbon and molecular hydrogen, molecular oxygen, uh, C2H2. And to, to my big surprise, uh, actually many of these reactions turned out to have no reaction barrier and we could actually form, for instance, cyclic CCH2 or HCH uh, in, in these reactions. So this is a very promising um, route to study reactions because uh, you can also uh, quantitatively give uh, reaction rates uh, as, as uh, demonstrated in the paper, uh, which is cited here. And uh, just to show you the... Um, the variety of species uh, which can be formed. Uh, this is uh, actually coming from the Goody Body Lab in California, and, and they did a very systematic study, uh, used ammonia, uh, methanol, and water. Uh, and uh, you see here uh, the different species uh, they could identify uh, in these uh, irradiation experiments. And that gives you already an idea that indeed. Uh, the molecular ice chemistry can be quite complex and as shown in the Minot experiments uh, uh, can, for instance, form sugars. So I thought I, I should uh, uh, really show you how complex you can go uh, in, in such an experiment. And uh, what is shown here is an experiment uh, uh, by the Trapp group uh, in Munich. And they actually started uh, uh, with purine and pyrimidine bases. Uh, here you see uh, the start of the two reaction routes. And then they added acetaldehyde and, and layer sugar. Uh, and indeed, uh, you could form uh, uh, the oxyribonucleosides in this reaction. And they pointed out that maybe you don't need to go uh, through NA, maybe you can also do it this way, uh, which they studied here. So I found that actually still quite amazing that somehow we can start with relatively simple molecules and, and can have a robust pathway to NA and DNA uh, compounds. So at the end, I thought I should, uh, uh, use one minute to, to make a bit of a shameless advertisement. So in Heidelberg, we have the initiative for the origins of life. And so what we are actually doing is uh, to study the formation of planets and uh, running planet population synthesis calculations. Uh, we are very much interested in the chemical environments for planet formation and how, for instance, water was transported uh, to planets. Then we are heavily involved in the search for rocky planets together with our Spanish and other German groups. Uh, we uh, use a ray velocity machine at Colalto Observatory in Spain to search for rocky planets. And uh, we have uh, a new director, Laura Kreitberg, and she is uh, actually investigating the atmospheres of these planets. And then we have a group studying primitive meteorites and uh, doing cosmic chemistry. 
I talked about our experimental investigations of the formation of organics. And then Oliver Trapp, who is a professor in Munich, is also a Max Planck Fellow uh, associated with our institute. And he is uh, studying RNA and DNA synthesis and using modern mass spec uh, technologies to identify uh, the different steps in these formation routes. With that, uh, I wanted to thank you for uh, your uh, interest uh, in organic molecules, and uh, I would be open to, to answer questions. So are there any questions? There is one question in the chat. Yeah, the, the, the question is, um, what is my opinion uh, on the hydrothermal vent theory for the origin of life as opposed uh, to a primordial soup? Um, I find it always interesting that uh, there are, seems to be like uh, uh, ideology camps uh, fighting against each other. And in my view, one should just uh, take the facts and, and see how far we come. For the uh, hydrothermal events, for quite a while, people pointed out that methane formation isn't a problem. But that has been actually debated recently, if you think about the HCN. The other issue is, of course, always a dilution problem for the hydrothermal vents. And I think one argument for the Darwin warm little ponds, whatever that may be exactly, is the fact that you can actually change, can get changes in wet dry cycles and different UV light. And that is very helpful if you think about polymerization. So, so I think there are a lot of features uh, attached to the warm pond hypothesis, which are actually helpful. And it is interesting that for many years, uh, relatively little work has been done in that direction, but more recently, there are quite a number of groups uh, which, which investigate the conditions of, of the warm little ponds more in detail. Uh, that, that's a very good question. The question is, do we, uh, if I, do you think we will ever detect free body mole complex molecules such as formamide or glyceraldehyde or even glycine in, in protoplanetary disks? Uh, I, I think the discovery of more complex molecules is, is extremely challenging uh, because of the sensitivity issue. Uh, I wouldn't exclude that we find, you know, uh, maybe a formamide or these molecules, but if you go much beyond that, uh, this is certainly close to impossible. So uh, it's it's very challenging because of our sensitivity limits, and and therefore I think the investigation of cometary material and meteorites gives us a better handle to go to more complex molecules. Oh, yeah, here is a very interesting question about the membranes. Uh, in fact, in, in the experiment I mentioned, um, where we start from HCN, they, they also could form lipid-like materials. Uh, I mean, not, not, I mean, membranes immediately, but uh, in this um, uh, synthesis process, indeed, they had some precursors for membranes as well. So let's see, you suggested the prebiotic origin of organic matter in space it seems very nice for very reduced HCN and corresponding compounds. Um, I mean, as I mentioned, formaldehyde, you know, um, has been actually discovered. And uh, you can form, form uh, formaldehyde in the molecular isis because uh, the molecular isis are actually water rich. So you, you have a lot of oxygen available for that. So and this has been demonstrated that it works. Okay, I 
don't see any any other may other. i may i ask an ingenious question no <laughs> No, ma magari alza la mano. Non c'è la mano alzata. Yes. Uh, is there an estimate of how much uh, uh, in mass, uh, how, how, how many uh, medium complexity organic molecules uh, could be of terrestrial origin and how many could be delivered by asteroids or comets? Yeah, so we, we, uh, we wrote a paper about that, uh, also with Ben Pierce, uh, not really about uh, what you asked for, but we estimated uh, in a way the infall rates and compared uh, the infall rate for in the planetary dust particles and meteorites, and then also estimated how much of the material would land in ponds, and if you also uh, uh, include sewage and so on, uh, if this would actually be. Uh, uh, a efficient route of delivery. Um, I think uh, to answer your question, what is the ratio of uh, these two types of molecules? Uh, I think we, we need to go back to our models and say, well, how much uh, delivery we have? And also, uh, I, I showed you this late veneer route, but I think we really need to, to find out if this is efficient way. I, the sunlit paper is very nice, uh, but it lacks a number of physics ingredients, and we, we have to study that more in detail. And I found that, you know, I, I really find that interesting. If you see uh, the the year of appearance of of these different results, that's all now. You know, it's it's a, the last couple of years, so it's it's a kind of uh, renaissance of this type of work. And what about the uh, so percentage I, I think that's just impossible yeah thank you and what about chirality yeah that that's uh, I didn't discuss this at all some of the reaction pathways actually lead to uh, a very high chirality and I have I mean astronomers have always proposed that you know circular polarization could lead to Viral molecule. I mean, you can produce some chirality. I, I'm personally very skeptical uh, because D is about more, uh, and you really need, uh, as you all know, use uh, very use. Uh, I actually think that this is part of uh, uh, deprecating systems to to form uh, this chirality. The best in the system that this uh, indeed works. So. There is a famous number of reaction where uh, where the chirality is actually produced. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So there seems to be no other questions. Uh, I think we can then. Um, Maybe stop here. <laughs> I think you have one last question. Okay, I saw it here. Sorry, sorry. So, so there was this question uh, about uh, uh, future missions. You know, what would excite me more most, and um, and also the evaluation of the possibility of extraterrestrial life. I have to admit that, uh, and that may be related to my background as an astronomer, I'm most excited about missions where we could actually find rocky planets around solar type stars. Because what you have, what we have done so far is to find rocky planets around low mass, but these objects are very active. They're, or sources of X-ray emission, and it's not obvious to me if they uh, provide the best conditions for life. What we have for the next missions, we have to find rocky planets around solar time, but we have and I would hope that we can at some point do spectroscopy of their atmosphere. Uh, if, if you ask me about uh, uh, the solar 
So I'm I'm still eager to see what happens uh, on Sim Titan, of course. But Titan is especially fascinating because of the the quality going on there. I mean, this we could learn more about Titan. That would be great. Okay, so I don't see any other questions. Then we may stop here. Yeah, many thanks, Thomas, again for getting um, to us. And uh, for all the others, please mark a day in the calendar. Next of our seminars will be in two weeks. Same day same time and i hope to see you see you again yeah